I'd like to um, uh, welcome you all to this very special uh, SOAS Centre of Taiwan Studies uh, seminar. I think it's going to be probably our, one of our largest uh, ever uh, seminars. It's for those people. Uh, today, today's seminar, we have a very, very special uh, guest, um, uh, Dr. Long Yintai, who's the uh, Taiwan's Minister of Culture. Uh, Dr. Long is, the, um, is someone who's very, very hard to uh, categorize. Uh, she's perhaps one of Taiwan's most influential public intellectuals. Uh, she's published well over 30 books, um, many of which um, have, create, have been bestsellers. Uh, for example, her book, 1949 Untold Stories, um, uh, has been uh, one such bestseller. Um, Dr. Long has a, a huge following, not only in Taiwan, in uh, Chinese communities abroad, but also in mainland China, where her books um, uh, so many of her books have been uh, pirated. And so, and when, whenever you see her, uh, her lectures um, abroad, often uh, something like uh, half the audience are often from the, the PRC. Dr. Long is also a, um, uh, a well-respected academic. She's taught at uh, universities in uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Germany. For example, one thing that Dr. Long and I have in common is we've both taught at uh, Heidelberg, one of my favorite German universities. Um, and a, a third uh, category that uh, Dr. Long has moved into over the last decade or so has been as a government official. She served uh, as the head of the um, Department of Culture in the Taipei uh, city government. Uh, and most recently, since um, 2012, she's been Taiwan's first um, uh, minister of culture in this newly formed uh, ministry. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, welcome her to, a, um, to, to SOAS for her first talk. Let me just say a few words um, about Taiwan studies here at, at SOAS. Um, we've, um, we've been, we, we uh, formed the um, Taiwan studies program back in 1999, at a time when um, Europe was essentially a Taiwan studies desert. The, uh, we were way behind the United States in um, courses, academic events, publications related to Taiwan. Over the last decade, there's been a real transformation of the field uh, in Europe. And at SOAS, we've tried to play an, a, a key role uh, in this development. Um, over the last uh, four, almost 14 years, we've become perhaps the world's leading institute for uh, Taiwan studies. Um, we have a MA degree in Taiwan studies. We have um, courses on Taiwan society and culture, three politics courses, Taiwan's economic development, Taiwan film, um, undergraduate courses in, and postgraduate in um, elementary Hokkien. Um, and the numbers of students studying Taiwan increases uh, year by year. Uh, we're also one of the leading providers um, of academic events related to Taiwan. We have a regular Taiwan Studies seminar. We run uh, annual international conferences on Taiwan. Uh, and we've also founded the European Association of Taiwan Studies, which runs a major international conference at a different European city uh, each year. Um, and thirdly, we've, um, we've worked to promote publications on Taiwan. Um, we, we managed the uh, Routledge Research on Taiwan book series. And over the last decade, we've published a large number of academic volumes and textbooks uh, on Taiwan. Um, and and I'm, I should also point out that what we've achieved over the last 14 years couldn't have been done without the support of uh, a number of Taiwanese institutes. Uh, for example, the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, uh, the uh, Jiang Jingguo Foundation, um, and have all been um, very generous in their support for our programs over the last uh, decade plus. Um, we've also um, received support from the, um, um, the body that um, the Council for Cultural Affairs, um, when in 2009 we won the uh, European, okay, the uh, French Taiwanese Culture Prize for the way we promoted Taiwan studies uh, in Europe. Um, today's event is going to be uh, slightly different from a, um, a, a regular uh, lecture. Um, if you take a look at uh, Dr. Long's YouTube um, lectures, one of the things that really stands out is how interactive uh, these sessions have been. Um, and uh, today will be no exception to this. She'll give a very brief talk, but the majority of the time will be for uh, Q&A. So hopefully um, some of my students will have got 
microphones, and they'll try and get you uh, microphones with, with questions. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to, uh, could we give uh, Dr. Long a big round of applause? Can you hear me all right from the back rows? It's OK. Um, I'm also slightly concerned if uh, there are still people outside, are they allowed to come in? <coughs> because I had one terrible experience when I gave a talk at the University of British Columbia um, at the Chan studio, uh, <coughs> the auditorium there. It's about 1,000, uh, there were 1,000 seats. And, um, they did very punctually to close the door at, uh, say, uh, 2 o'clock shop. And there were people outside who were not allowed in. And later on, I received emails from some of them who were not allowed in. One guy said uh, he actually drove for, five, for, six, uh, for nine hours to get to the place, and he was locked outside. So since then, I always ask if there's still people outside. And uh, actually, you're standing still. Actually, if we can keep the fire marshal away, <laughs> Maybe you should move forward. Now, there, are, there are places here. Come move forward. And there's one empty seat right there between Chris Wood, who is going to be the representative to Taiwan in two weeks. He goes on to report there. There's one seat there. And actually, please move over here. Sit right next to Dr. Phil. <laughs> please come forward. Please come forward. And make yourself really comfortable. You are here anyway. So we, we might as well have fun with it. All right. Okay. <laughs> There's one seat here. <laughs> People complaining outside. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> okay. We'll begin. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, you know me, but I would like to also know a little bit about you. And as usual, I really want to know who I am talking to today. So just roughly, I can only see there are women and there are men here in this room. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit, give me a feeling and impression of where you come from so that I know that um, how large the scope is. Those who consider that they come from China, can you just say hi to me? Oh. Wow, <laughs> very nice. Those coming from Taiwan, nice to see you. Anybody from Hong Kong? Great. <laughs> Hong Kong is my home too. Macau? One. One, hi. <laughs> and Singapore? Okay, uh, Malaysia? Great. Did I miss any, any place? Denmark? South Korea. <laughs> okay, from the US? Oh, yes. Wow. <laughs> I just move over. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, just move forward, move forward so that you don't get congested there. Okay. Uh, sit behind me. Move behind me as well. Dr. Feld, we should take a picture of this room. <laughs> um, can we quickly settle somehow because, well, there's space here, right here. Please move, please move, please, please. Please move quickly because the time is really limited. And please move forward because, please move. Watch out for Dr. Feld's foot. Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> Are you okay? You're going to stand there for, for the next 90 minutes? Oh. <laughs> okay, good. Um, um, is there anybody who is really coming from pretty far away extra for this? Raise your hand. Where are you coming from? From Bristol. Okay. <laughs> and? Nottingham. Nottingham. And? Bristol as well. Bristol as well. And you? Okay. <laughs> Good to see you here. Good to see you here. And then one embarrassing question. Are you here because I'm a writer or because I'm a minister? <laughs> <laughs> or both. <laughs> or you come here despite that I'm a mis minister. <laughs> and thank you very much for your generosity. <laughs> um, well, this was not intended to be a lecture at all, as Dr. Feld said. I have a horribly busy schedule back home. And then I spent last week uh, <clears throat> doing a lot of things in Paris. And so I actually had absolutely no time to prepare a real lecture. So today is really meant to be a chat, a conversation. However, I still have to give uh, some kind of introduction as a basis for our conversation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a very boring aspect of my life, that is the Ministry of Culture. Um, if you have been to the Ministry of Culture, it's not called Ministry of Culture, it's called Media and Culture and so on. In London, you see a beautiful classic building. And if you would visit the Ministry of Culture in Paris, you will be also very impressed by the beauty and the history of the building. And if you would visit me in the Ministry of Culture in Taiwan, you would come across a very ugly building, <laughs> a concrete block, which was not meant to be a public uh, building at all. It was built as a, for, uh, as a building for private housing. And the government is renting this place. Uh, the government has been renting this place for the past 10 years. Um, and because it's not meant to be, f to be for uh, public offices, and therefore my personal office and the offices of my deputy ministers are kind of all squeezed in some attics, you know. So it's, it's very nondescript, uh, um, unattractive place to work in. It does not uh, represent the aesthetics of a cultural place. However, if you read one of my uh, books, I think it's in Banyan uh, Sisuo, I told a little story of, um, of a plant called the Desert Rose. Does anybody know what, what I'm referring to? Sha uh, Mo, Okay. Uh, I went to Israel once, one time, and um, a friend there gave me a small plant to take home. When she gave me this plant, I looked at it, it was just a bunch of dry grass. I didn't know why she gave me a bunch of dry grass to take home, but I did anyway. So um, once back home in, in, in Germany, I put this um, bunch of dry grass, weed, into a small pot and I put the water in there. Since then, um, I, take, I took a look at this plant every day when I got in the door. So the first day, it was as dry as bone. It's ugly, like hell. Uh, and the second day went by, and the third day, and the fourth day, when I just happened to take a glance at that thing, I was taken aback because this, um, this um, ugly looking plant, which was all crumpled together, in with water, it actually has sprawled out. It has kind of a reaching out with the arms and legs. Then I saw the shape of this plant. It really had the shape of a rose. It really is a rose. And the, four, the, far, the fifth day, I saw that the color began to change. 
the renewed, fresh, green, um, greenish came back in, starting from the center of this rose pattern, and slowly each day it spread out so that the whole thing, which used to look like a very, just a black thing, nondescript thing, it turned out to be a very beautiful green rose standing in my kitchen. And that day when I was taking a close look at this beautiful thing, it just happened my neighbor came in together with me. I looked at the plant, I showed her, I said, Erica, look how beautiful this thing is. Just you have to look at this desert rose. She looked at it and she said, ugh. <laughs> what an ugly thing that is. That was the moment when I realized, hmm, this thing is absolutely stunningly beautiful to me because I knew where it came from. I knew what it was like before. I knew the process in which something is happening to her. And therefore, when I saw life in it, to me, it's a it's beauty. To her, she did not know, she did not participate in the process. She saw just one slice of existence there, and to her, by absolute standard, it's nothing at all. That had a great inspiring meaning to me. So I'm referring to the Ministry of Culture of Taiwan. I'm referring to that ugly building in which we work day in and day out. The Ministry of Culture of Taiwan was officially established actually in on May 20th last year. So it's not even a year yet. Starting from January 1st is uh, the real budget for the cultural ministry for the very first time. It's very, very new. And uh, if you want to uh, listen to an official uh, briefing on the Ministry of Culture, you will hear the following. The ministry has, two, uh, has seven departments. The first one is the Department of General Planning, in which we look into the future we study the trend of the creative industry. We study what is going to happen to Taiwan 30 years from today on. The children are going to be so few that our schools are empty. And when the schools are empty and our children are so few, how do we redistribute our budget, our resources, according to the old rule? Shouldn't something change? And we also have the Department of Cultural Resources, under which we manage museums, we manage cultural centers from north to south, from east to west, uh, including the off islands of Jinmen and Mazu. We manage historical heritages, and we try very hard to do community work in Taiwan. And then we have the Department of Arts, especially visual arts and performing arts. If you go to Edinburgh and you see the um, performances of uh, groups from Taiwan, they are probably supported by the Ministry of Culture. And if you see an exhibition in London of Taiwanese artists, they are probably funded by the Ministry. And fourthly, we have the Department of uh, Creative Industry, which I don't need to uh, explain because the UK is so famous as the place with very, very successful schemes for creative industry. And we are trying very hard to promote our creative industries as well. And um, over the lunch table, which was very uh, uh, kindly organized by uh, Mr. Chris Wood, who is all sitting right in the middle there, um, I was asked by uh, an official from the uh, UK uh, Ministry of Culture. He asked me, well, what is the biggest challenge for you in terms of creative industry in Taiwan? I said, I can give you one concrete example, then you understand uh, what is our biggest challenge. That is, there was a, um, a, a surgeon uh, assistant, a, a woman who works in the hospital. 
she helps with operations. So she used to, with her very um, a, um, uh, smart fingers, she used to sew together broken parts or uh, fragmented um, uh, organs. And she decided that she was sick and tired of that kind of life, so she moved away from Taipei and moved right into uh, 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 the Taidong um, uh, County, where most people are of the Aboriginal origin, uh, lived right next uh, along the coast of the Pacific Ocean. She opened a small shop in which she began to, with her smart fingers, she began to weave hats. And the design of her hats is so beautiful that very soon designers discovered her because her hats could be sold or exhibited on Fifth Avenue or uh, Champs-Élysées in Paris. And the, um, the, the, the task that, that's facing us is how do we bring these talented artists-like people together with the market? How do we make her beautiful things seen by the companies, by customers? How does she develop her market so that she can survive, she can, she can go on with her creative work? We also have the Department of Human, uh, Humanities and Publishing, in which we try to take care of our literary writers, our publishing industry, which, as you know, the traditional way of publishing paper printing is a sunset industry. And if you do not quickly learn how to digitalize your work and how you run your companies, publishing companies, um, in an uh, international mode, you are a dying um, industry. And we're trying to do a lot on this. And the sixth one is the Department of Film and Media and Popular Music. Uh, cinema, as people in this room would know that we have a pool of world-class talents, especially with directors such as uh, Hou Xiaoxian or Cai Mingliang. Um, we also have uh, first top quality um, documentary filmmakers. And in terms of popular music, um, as you probably know that in, in China mainland, for instance, I know those students from China, uh, the songs you sing or the songs that you listen to, a high percentage of them are written, are created by Taiwanese uh, uh, songwriters. And in the Chinese KTVs, for instance, we have investigated that of every, uh, of every 10 songs which has been chosen, about seven of them are from Taiwanese writers, Taiwanese songwriters. So there's a huge industry there, but because the um, piracy, Dr. Feld has mentioned that, in, uh, the, the bridge of uh, uh, intellectual property, the, our songwriters actually have a hard way of surviving because they don't earn what they deserve to earn. And to negotiate with Beijing about the protection of intellectual property is one of our important works at the moment. And um, the last, but one of the most important department is the Department of International Cultural Exchange. And um, as you know, um, for political reasons and historical reasons, Taiwan has a hard time to be connected with the international community. And when politics fails, we try with culture. And uh, that is why the, our work with international exchanges is very, very vital for the intellectual growth of our children as well. And that was the boring part of the work, <laughs> breathing. Um, so, I want to move on to the next topic that is, well, Long Yun Tai, what are the major challenges to you? Not on the technical level, but uh, intellectually, on the broader perspective, what are the most important challenges to you? I would say uh, it's very interesting and it's very unique, and that is um, nobody from the outside would see this. That is, the Ministry of Culture is actually the first 
new ministry since 1949 as the, the first one. So I should give credit to President Ma that this is the first new ministry that he establishes. And well, as when I was a child, I loved to see documentary film on plants, especially when the blossoming of a flower opening up under small lotion, a small slow motion. So you see how the flower goes at every step of it, like my desert rose. I think the Ministry of Culture now is part of that, uh, in that motion, in that uh, state of becoming, and it's exciting to be inside it and taking part in it. And I give you one very concrete example. Uh, the, the establishment of the Ministry of Culture is um, kind of a heart and parcel of this democratization process, the blossoming of Taiwan. i give you an example. So half of my staff, we have about, well, uh, within the Ministry we have about 500 uh, staff employees. In the larger circle, we have altogether about 2,000 people working under the umbrella of uh, the Ministry of Culture. And uh, the ministry was kind of pieced together from four different ministries. So during the first eight months, uh, we had to sort out who is who and where is what, because it's a huge uh, organizational work. And then one day, all of a sudden, I was told, Minister, we have five people working at the Keelong Custom House. I said, why Ministry of Culture has five people working at the Custom? What do they do? Well, they check everything that comes from China. <laughs> they examine them, and if we use the uh, word from old time, we censor them. <laughs> so I said, oh, that still exists, you know? Uh, yes, it does. As a, as a matter of fact, um, the Ministry of Culture is composed mainly of the old uh, Cultural Council and then the old GIO, which means Government Information Office. And the nature of Government Information Office is it is responsible for um, cosmetics of the government yeah, as spokesperson for the government. So you have, a, you have to have a specific mindset to do that job. And that, uh, that mindset is not what I would imagine the right mindset for a cultural ministry. So we, it's like we have a huge class. I said uh, I'm leading a huge PhD seminar that in which everybody is learning. You know, We all have to change our old habits of working and even the basic concept. For instance, before I came to this lecture hall, I, um, I use the WhatsApp and ask my um, director of cinema, film, and broadcasting. I asked him, Zhu Wenqing, please tell me um, how many Chinese mainland films are we still uh, watching and censoring uh, last year? We have a whole team still working on in the room watching imported Chinese uh, TV series, Lian Xu Ju. So I said, give me the figure. OK, now I'm giving you the exact figure. That is, last year, as 2012, my team, my people, they have, OK, there have been 861 items, meaning titles of TV series, soap operas were not. Uh, and altogether, it means 1,600, 600, no, what's the figure? 1,600, six, no. <laughs> <laughs> Too many zeros. Six, uh, about 1,700 volumes of TV series that my staff has to sit in that dark room and watching on the screen reading and watching everything. And altogether, it means it's uh, 
一万一千三百二十六个小时。我的天 ，How do I say that? Eleven, eleven hundred, eleven thousand. No, eleven hundred. But anyway. <laughs> So you know number of hours. So my poor uh, colleagues, they have to sit in front of the TV and watch 1,100, 11,000, 11,000. Yes, 11,000 hours of Chinese soap opera. I mean, that's the worst job you could have. Why are you still doing that? Are you uh, watching out that they don't say anything that's uh, <laughs> uh, Viva Communism or so, uh, what, what is it? What are you watching out for? Well, they have to do that because before you stop doing that, you have to change the laws. And for us to change the regulations and laws, it takes time. We haven't managed to change all the laws yet. And then we are civil servants, so we do everything according to the letter of the law, and therefore we still have to go on watching those um, soap operas. <laughs> 11,000 hours. Um, it, just, uh, it just means that we are in transition. We are in transition, and it takes time. Um, and, uh, and then we had another discussion. We, um, I communicated a lot with my staff who is uh, WhatsApp. So some of my staff uh, is here and they smile. Um, I read in the news just um, yesterday, and the news reported that uh, Ministry of Culture uh, censored a, an imported, uh, I think the US of Hollywood film because in it there is are ex there is extreme violence. So I was thinking, hmm, this is again you are doing it according to the law, and which we haven't managed to change yet. So yesterday I was talking to the um, uh, I was talking to the cinema uh, um, policymaker in in Paris. So I asked him, well, tell me precisely how do you do the classification of film. And he said, well, that's according to the content that's under six years or 12 years old or 18 years old. So I said, so it means that above 18 years, then you have no limit at all. Do you know that about the UK? What is the case with the UK? Is there any limit at all on content when it's above 18 years old? Well, anyway, the French do it. Uh, he told me explicitly, no, for the films which are for audience above 18 years of age, there's no limit. So I said, now tell me, if I'm a um, director and I make a film and I'm an artist, I kill a baby, I film it, and I eat it. I film it too, and it's a movie. Can I show it? Do you show it to people over 18? <laughs> he, said, he was stunned. <laughs> he said, well, if it's a film, then yes, it's legal. There's no limit. But uh, if it's real, then it's a criminal case. <laughs> OK, so I gave him a second example. I said, uh, suppose I uh, produce the film in which the clear message is all Jews should be killed. What do you do about that? Guess what his answer is? Is it okay or not? Yes, same, it's okay. But there will be huge uproar, debate, and fights, but that's another matter. Okay, so just to give an example, because we had censorship before, Taiwan was uh, liberalized in 1987, and now it's already 2013, and the Ministry of Culture, in this long process of uh, democratization and modernizing ourselves, we are still in the process of making Taiwan a really, truly, thoroughly more liberal more tolerant place, but that really needs a process, and we're still in the middle of it. Um, 
if I go on further, well, I, we're not going to have time to do QA, so I'm going to finish very soon. Um, if you ask me, <coughs> well, what are some of the fundamental questions you and your staff at the Ministry of Culture are asking yourselves? Here they are. Um, I ask myself and I, I ask my staff to ask themselves this question. As Ministry of Culture, what we are doing is actually, we collect tax from people and then we redistribute them. Do you give more money to the middle class? You, do you provide service uh, for the national theater uh, where people would dress up and uh, walk the red carpet with crystal lights? Or do you put more emphasis on in the countryside to help with the grassroots community work? Which one is more important? Um, I ask my staff that you always have to keep in mind this crucial question to yourself, that is, imagine a 12-year-old child walking down the street in center of Taipei, the, the poshest, the most beautiful area of town, and imagine that he walks for 10 minutes, he will, re he will reach the National Theater, and then another five minutes, he would be in the middle of the cinema area. He gets everything. Compare this child to another 12-year-old kid who lives, he, who grows up, in the middle of the Aboriginal tribe in the Taidong uh, County uh, along the Pacific Coast. What kind of resources does he have and compare the two? So these are one of the fundamental questions that we keep asking ourselves. If you want to have a second example, I would say uh, the fundamental task facing us is, as you know, because of political reasons, the 23 million Taiwanese are pretty much deprived of their global citizenship because because the problem of the Taiwan Strait, the Taiwanese are not allowed to um, officially take part in many of the international organizations or, or, or uh, uh, international uh, uh, activities. And that is why we have to do extra work to do cultural exchanges so that the work of our creative spirits gets to be seen by the international communities. The scholarship that is being done by our scholars will not be unseen because we are not a recognized entity in the international uh, circle. And we also want to give our children to have a fair chance of uh, interacting with the global community so that they are not affected by this political factor. And a third example is peace with China. Of course, it's very important work. Um, you ask, if you ask me about Long Yutai, you are not defense minister. Why are you talking about um, peace with China? Well, I think it might be wise to that I and the defense minister would swap our jobs. <laughs> that would not be a bad idea. Um, if you read my book on 1949, you would understand that I think it's a prime, most important uh, mission for our generation to prevent any possibility of war across the state. How do you achieve that aim? You can have political means where the political leaders from both sides would shake hands or even sign treaties. However, if you do not have the authentic mutual trust from both sides, coming from the people, coming from the people themselves, I think any treaties that are signed by political handshakes are probably not really reliable because they can be designed or they, they can be torn. And therefore, the ministry culture puts a lot of emphasis on cultural exchanges with uh, China as well. Um, finally, then I'll stop. Um, I spent um, 
13 years of my life in Europe. Uh, I remember my older son, Andy, when he was six and he got into primary school the first year. You know, when a German kid goes into school the first day, uh, they, they always wear, they have uh, on their shoulder, uh, it's a satchel, very colorful satchel, green, um, yellow, red. And he came back the first day uh, very proud. He wanted to show mommy uh, the books, the first ever books from school, first school day. And uh, he took out from the, his satchel a <coughs> map. It's a huge map. When it's opened up, uh, it, it's very big. Uh, so, uh, and he, he was very small, of course. So we opened up the map, and you could imagine the, the picture where the mother and the son, we both crawl on that, on that map and, and try to, uh, to, to read that map with our fingers. Of course, I thought it's a world map. I thought, wow, my child is going to learn the world map. Until when the map was fully open on the floor, I realized, oh my goodness, it's not a world map, it's a map of our village. <laughs> <laughs> our village is called Schönberg. Schönberg has a population of, uh, well, actually, altogether was 18,000, but in Schönberg, it's, it's maybe 8,000. So it's a huge map of a village with 8,000 population. And, and of course, I still went with him with both fingers through all the little streams and little pools and every stone and almost every tree in that map. But this experience had a thundering effect on me. Because as you know, I, well, I was born in 1952. Several generations of the Taiwanese have grown up in Taiwan learning only about the Yangtze River and the Yellow River <laughs> and all the mountains in China. We grew up never having learned the names of the rivers where you really swam in. You never learned the name of the mountains that uh, you did go with your parents. And um, so I looked at the map and I thought, hmm, that's a really a different way of growing up. And re it really is a different way of shaping your Weltanschauung, your, your, your world views. Uh, I use this example as the last to end my uh, talk, is because I want to say that um, Taiwan is an exciting place. As I said at the very beginning, it's like a uh, you are watching a flower blossoming, opening up in slow motion. Um, if you can get rid of the ideological biases, just observing it freshly, then um, it's, um, it's a rare chance for you to take part in something that is authentic, that is historical, that is not being, but in the process of becoming. So welcome to Taiwan. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thanks for that um, uh, inspiring uh, talk. And I think um, it really ties in nicely with a lot of things that we've been uh, discussing on, on our various courses on Taiwan. I mean, just yesterday we were talking about the, the debate about the quality of Taiwan's democracy because there's so been a lot of uh, pessimism about the state of Taiwan's democracy over the last decade or so. Um, and when we were looking at this topic, we tend to underplay the role of culture in the consolidation of Taiwan's democracy, uh, similarly in terms of Taiwan's role in soft power. Um, there's many things that I'd like to ask, but I think I shouldn't be selfish. I'm sure we have a, a lot of questions. We've got two uh, student helpers, one on this side, one on this side. So uh, they'll be um, passing the microphone around. So who would like to uh, ask the first question? So we've got one, 
Um, okay, and you get the second one. Okay, so could you, uh, Felicitas, could you give that one? And, and Nino, can you, have you spotted the second one? Um, yeah, this, this guy here. Dr. Will, can we have maybe three questions at one time? Yeah, let's take, um, yeah. we'll take three questions. Oh, and this will be the, um, the third one at the front. Okay. Oh, you've got it. Okay. Okay, okay go ahead. Uh, thanks very much for the, um, the talk. It was brilliant. Um, one thing, one thing you mentioned uh, was about popular Taiwan's popular music. Um, I've been both a participant and an observer in the Taiwan music scene for the last few years, and I think Taiwan has probably got the most exciting music scene in in Asia at the moment. Um, and yet, it's the Korean music scene that is uh, being exported to the rest of the world. I was wondering, uh, in the Ministry of Culture, do you have a strategy? or how are you developing a strategy to promote uh, and export um, the fantastic resource of music that you have in Taiwan? Okay, you have the second one. Uh, hi, I'm from China, and my question is about uh, a couple of days ago, the Taiwan politician Xie Changting's microblogging account uh -huh. in China was uh, shut down. So what's your comment on that? And my second question is about uh, we know you are a very successful writer, but right now you are also a government official. So what do you think is the real difference between you and the, you know, the professional politicians such as Tsai Ing-wen or... Uh, <laughs> yes, that's two, qu two questions. Okay, brilliant. Um, we've got w one more question this side, and then we'll take one more. Uh, so we'll take this one, and then we'll come back to you, okay? Oh, okay. Okay. Wait. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Jan Zendermann. I'm a student from Germany, and I'd like to ask a question that concerns me as a, um, a mainland European. Um, I read a... <laughs> 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 well, I guess in the UK you just call it Europe, right? Yeah. But <laughs> uh, I, I read um, an article of, uh, in a Guangzhou newspaper um, today arguing that people in Guangdong province and in Hong Kong shouldn't speak Cantonese in public because it um, it's unwelcoming to people from other parts of China. And um, in my anecdotal experience from Taipei, young people in, in Taiwan, or many young people, seem um, embarrassed when they have to speak Taiwanese um, in front of other people. <laughs> Um, yeah, and my question is, um, do you think in three or four generations um, Chinese dialects other than Mandarin will still um, exist the way they exist today? Okay, would we take that fourth question then? Uh, we'll thank you very much for your talk. My name is Feng Xue from IRC. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, during your, your time in the office, what kind of measures you, you would or would like to take in order to facilitate the, the cultural exchange between Manila and China and Taiwan? And uh, in the end of your, 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 your term, in the end of your time in the office, what kind of atmosphere or what kind of uh, environment you would like to see I mean, the, the in terms of the cultural perspective between 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 Mandan and Taiwan. Thank you. Okay, that's quite a lot of questions there. <laughs> <laughs> K-pop and Taiwanese pop. I think K-pop has become so um, successful in terms of um, commercial gains as well as uh, promotion internationally. It has a lot to do with the fact that uh, Korea has started out its, um, well, there's somebody behind me though. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not squeezing you. <laughs> okay. Um, it has something to do with the fact that Korea started uh, uh, rather early in starting out its organizational creative industry. So uh, with, the, with the right, with the um, huge chunk of investment from the government, and plus institutionalize this effort, so they have gone pretty far. Um, at the same, so, so you have to give them credit for having made the right strategy. If we consider culture also a form of um, of goods of production, so they have been very effective in that way. Um, However, you could also uh, counter, offer a counter-argument by saying that um, um, 
can you can one possibly overdoing this cultural um, production or cultural create creative industry um, by offering an example saying um, during the Cold War when you look at the result of the gold medal number of gold medals from which country uh, you found out that uh, um, the highest number of gold medals were always won by uh, the the Eastern Bloc. And the way they do it, they did it was by uh, organization institutionalized sports. And uh, actually the state was running it. And when you move that into culture, I think it is legitimate to raise the question whether this is the right way to promote culture. I think that's a philosophical question. And that is in my mind as well when I uh, compose my cultural policy. I would still I would still hope that culture has before it becomes an industry, it has to be culture at the first place. And as culture, it has to come from the grassroots, it has to come from the heart, it has to be spontaneous. It's only the second or the third or the fourth step where you turn it into a commodity and turn it into an industry. It's not to say that industry is not important, it is. However, I think we should never forget that at the first place, it is culture. Okay, well, this is a very, it's a very rough way of answering your question. Uh, as to Mr. Xie Changting's um, <laughs> blog, <laughs> Uh, micro blog being censored, I don't think it's worth um, comment. <laughs> oh. yeah. uh, because what has been censored there is beyond your imagination. So Mr. Xie's uh, micro blog is a very, very small thing by comparison. So let's look at the real big picture. There are really essential issues by comparison. So it's too small to be commented on. Um, as to myself versus um, like very talented Miss Tsai Yingwen, I think that's comparing banana with oranges. <laughs> Um, she is a uh, dedicated professional politician. I am a fully dedicated writer, only taking my time to do a temporary job at the Ministry of Culture. <laughs> so there's no comparison. Um, the Hong Kong people and the Guangdong people, whether they should um, speak the dialect or not, and this is my very strong conviction. I think dialect, first of all, is everyone's natural right to speak it. It is a right you are born with. You know the reason why it's called the mother tongue? For most people, dialect is your mother tongue. Please tell me, which country has the right to tell you that you should not speak your mother's tongue? Can you accept that? That's one aspect of it. The second aspect is I regret myself that I don't speak any dialect. My father comes from Hunan province. You cannot understand him because <laughs> 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 and my mother comes from Zhejiang dialect. It's hard to understand oh. her too. Um, I grew up in Taiwan. I was taught to think that my Mandarin is the only correct and superior way of speaking. And therefore, I ended up speaking only Mandarin. So when people tell me, commented on my Mandarin saying, wow, <laughs> you speak beautiful Mandarin, I said, at the cost of my dialect at the cost of my dialect, look at Mo Yan's works, or um, Jia Pinghua, uh, even our Huang Chunming. Dialect is, um, is the blood vessel of your body. Without the blood vessel, anything that you expresses is lacking in 
its most authentic imagination. It is a flower not planted into us. So dialect is the root of your expression. And more than that, I don't need to say, period. Okay. Um, I guess. With mainland China, <laughs> well, this is the first thing, first time I ever I heard that um, continent Europe versus uh, UK <laughs> 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 across the strait. <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, well, the cultural exchanges between Taiwan and China, there is one basic structural difference. That is, um, the cultural activities which come from the mainland, for example, performing arts, coming from China to perform in Taiwan, they can be uh, state-organized. But Taiwan is of a, a democratic structure where um, all the exchanges are done by uh, private initiatives. They are all private sector initiated by individuals or, or private groups. And therefore the state, the ministry, we do not organize everything so, and sought to carry on this exchange with China. What we do is, uh, I th we, we think that to build mutual trust is a very important thing. And therefore we like to facilitate exchange of culture. And what we do is we look at what are the obstacles there. For example, when our orchestra, our national orchestra, goes to play in Beijing or in, in Changchun, uh, their, their musical instruments, hundreds of musical instruments, are get stuck at the custom because of this regulation and that regulation. Um, that we try to uh, solve these problems to facilitate cultural exchanges, but we do not really direct the cultural exchanges. Okay, yeah. yeah um, go ahead. Thank you so much for the talk. It's very inspirational. Um, my name is Guan Chen, currently teaching at Nottingham Business School. I'm a senior lecturer there. Um, I'm from Taiwan myself, so I'm very proud that you're here today. Um, just a couple of questions, really. Um, in the past couple of years, a few years, um, I have been heavily involved in supporting different uh, cultural activities, especially the artists coming from Taiwan to do the exchange performances here. Um, currently, um, as an academic, I'm working together with the practitioners from the arts and culture industries and wanted to contribute to the culture and art activities in Taiwan. So as a minister of culture in Taiwan, I don't know what kind of expectations or what kind of involvement you expect or you would like the academics who are working overseas to get involved in, and what can we do to facilitate the arts and culture activities from Taiwan. And just on the note of that, I've got one of my business partner, well, research project partner here with me. It's William Taylor from uh, Business of Culture, the director here with me, and uh, to, to share some thoughts. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, Dr. Long. It's, it's a great pleasure to see you today, and I, I'm a PhD student. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm a PhD student at Oxford, so before I came, I collected questions from my Oxford fellows. Uh, friends, uh, uh, well, we would like to let you know that you have become uh, the role model for a lot of very well educated, independent, and ambitious girls in our generation. <laughs> 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 because, because you really, <laughs> yeah, because you already developed a very successful career path through a global revolving door, like universities and family and and uh, uh, politics and everywhere. So we would like to ask what are the uh, crucial certainties and uncertainties in your life and what's your life planned? And yeah, our, your suggestions for <coughs> the fellow girls. Thanks. Okay. Um, um, one there, but we'll, we'll take this one first. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, Dr. Lung. Uh, first of all, I would say um, I'm part of that generation as well, being inspired by you greatly since very young. I'm currently teaching documentary films at the uh, University of uh, Kent in the film department. Uh, while you are talking about film censorship, my first question is actually regarding to that. What's your criteria if you uh, still continue uh, uh, film censorship in Taiwanese cinema? And uh, the second one, um, as we have this talk in the university settings, um, what such suggestion would you give to, um, uh, to bring the scholarship from the academic world to the general, um, much wider audience? That is how uh, the role of um, academic intellectuals and how can we contribute better to the society? Thank you. Paris, you expressed your willingness to travel to mainland China within the years. And do you have some preconditions? When do you think it's the right time to visit there and in what identity? Thank you very much. Hi. Hi, um, I'm from Korea, and I, w <laughs> I was curious uh, how, how you define culture. Has your definition of culture changed or affected by being a minist uh, minister of culture? And also you said um, culture has to come first in, in terms of culture industry. And do you not sometimes have to compromise your definition of culture or your perception of role of culture when you in terms, you know, in the process of police, police making, like if the other people that you have you have to work with uh, put more emphasis on the industry rather than culture, how would you cope with that? Yes. Okay, so that's, that's, that's some big questions there. <laughs> okay. Folks, too bad. Time is too short. <laughs> okay. Um. If you are living and working overseas and you would like to uh, be of some contribution to um, the promotion of Taiwanese culture or culture, cultural exchanges uh, overall, what you can do, um, this is really too broad. Uh, there are so many possible ways. One is you might decide to quit here and go back home and work there and join the Ministry of Culture, for example. <laughs> and you might decide uh, that I want to start writing here for the Chinese language audiences or for the UK audiences. That's one way of uh, participating and contributing. You might, uh, and if you already have a structure uh, w in which you are working with the cultural network, um, I met with the uh, director of the Edinburgh in Edinburgh Festival, for example, he um, he recognizes that that Taiwan has a, a unique perspective on culture and and very special creative spirits coming out there, and therefore he would uh, pay special attention there, trying to find out who and which groups are the best and the, the, the Western world could benefit from getting to know them. So if you already have that structure, this might be the way of, of doing it, because there are hundreds of ways. And then about this generation of young and beautiful and talented women <laughs> who <laughs> like to take me as a role. <laughs> Ambitious. I want to tell you that you are wrong because this is a very bad role model. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I, I am definitely not a good role model because I have no plan for my life. I've never had one. Um, I'll give you one example. Um, how I have uh, not planned out my path. Instead, I have always been, all my life, been guided by like what's coming out of my heart. Um, in my time, when I got my PhD in the United States, 
um, the fashionable thing at that time to do was to somehow try to get a green car and stay in the United States and don't go back. Uh, however, I wanted to go back to Taiwan in 1982, 83, and the reason why, there's only one reason, and uh, that reason you will laugh at. That reason was, hmm, I have been grow I've grown up in Taiwan only as a, stu a little girl and a student. I didn't know where the market is to buy the vegetables. I didn't know Taiwan as a society at all. I never lived there as an adult. And and how could that be? I have to get to know Taiwan first with my adult eye. I was 20 when I got my PhD. I don't know, young. <laughs> 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 and so I decided to go back to Taiwan. As simple as that. Uh, no career plan, I went back. And in 1985, and, and that's why I was shocked by Taiwan, and I wrote Ye Huo Ji, The Wildfire, because I was so shocked that this is the Taiwan, uh, the, my country. So, uh, so I wrote this wildfire, and uh, if with career plan, you would say well, I was overnight a star and the hero and so on. But I got my baby and decided this is time to breastfeed the child. <laughs> so I left, the, I left Taiwan, I went to Switzerland, and I breastfed my children for two years. I disappeared from that public life. So that was not career planning. <laughs> I stayed in, uh, in Europe for 13 years until one day I got the phone call from the mayor's office, Mayor Ma of Taipei. The office staff asked, Professor Long, would you kindly give us your curriculum because Mayor Ma would like to have it? And on the telephone I answered, I'm not asking for a job from the mayor. <laughs> if he wants to get to know me, go buy books. That's what I said to Mr. Ma Injo at that time. <laughs> that was not career planning. <laughs> and uh, then he somehow, he flew to Frankfurt. And he came to my home. Um, actually, his staff called me and said uh, Mayor Ma was in Rome, but he seek because there was he was trying to av uh, avoid the reporters, so he flew only with one personal assistant to Frankfurt to meet me. When he arrived, it was pitch dark at night, so the his assistant actually asked me if I would drive to the airport to meet him. <laughs> as arrogant and ignorant as I was. At that time, believing that the intellectual is somebody who is as powerful as king, I told his assistant, why should I go to him? He should come to my house. <laughs> and I was so ignorant because I did not even know what a busy schedule a mayor has and how tired he must be. I was totally heartless and ignorant. So he came to my home. And that's how I got back and became his culture minister. So that was an accident. Um, and so uh, I w in 2003, I finished my one turn. He got re-elected. Uh, I should continue with the second term. I decided, no, I want to write books. So I left. I went to Hong Kong. And I wrote Da Jiang Da Hai. So I am not a good role model. <laughs> uh, so forget about me. It's not a good model. <laughs> uh, now, documentary. I, my own crit criteria for censorship, um, my own criteria is one thing. Um, my own personal criteria is I would like to do the way the French do it. There's no limit. You have to respect for mature individual. And the mature individual in a democratic society has the right to decide for him or herself what he is allowed or not allowed to see. However, Taiwan is a democracy, and therefore, my personal view pers plays only one part. We have to get consensus. We have to talk different groups. We have to sp speak with the NGO. We have to have a lot of discussion and debates. Okay. And uh, how do you ac ac uh, academicians contribute to society? This is similar to the way I answered. There are 100 ways of contributing to society. The most important thing is you have to be happy. 
about what you do and how you live. I think that is the most, be truthful to yourself is probably the most important key to anything at all, be it success or not. Be truthful to yourself. Um, in what capacity would I travel to China? Um, I've said many times that at any time is the right time. I could go to China any time. However, um, um, if uh, whether I should go not in my capacity as a minister, that is thing that we have to negotiate and we have to decide. So uh, when that is a political um, a barrier, we would have to think. Um, we have to we have to evaluate what is the most most important thing whether to keep that status or to emphasize that capacity is the most important cornerstone or otherwise we are still um, talking about it okay final definition of culture I did that once before I was working at the city government and in Taipei City and uh, I remember that was a cold winter and we were defending our budget and uh, I walked into I was stay I was being I was taking questions from from the uh, the city parliamentarians and there were 52 parliamentarians who would come in and out but we had to stay there. At that time, it was 24 hours. We were there waiting, and it was very cold outside. Uh, I was put on the stand, and then there's one parliamentarian who walked in. He, he was red because he just drank and he had food. So he asked me, tell me what is culture? Um, <laughs> this is what I said to him. Uh, to me, culture is you look at the person walking towards you, the way he carries himself or herself. Uh, when a tree branch is hanging too low, how does he brush it away? When a dirty uh, stray dog walk across his legs and, uh, 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 and um, uh, hinder, is hinder uh, in German or English? English. It's English. Verb <laughs> hinders. Him. Does he uh, automatically uh, give give the dog a hit, hard hit kick, or otherwise, or do he, does he treat the dog gently? Okay, so culture is uh, it expresses itself in the way you carry yourself, how you treat others, how you treat your environment how you treat yourself, self-respect, and the holistic um, attitude of that I call culture. Okay, I want to thank you so very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Long, for this. One, one other thing I should mention is that uh, this event was planned at very, very short notice. It wasn't part of Dr. Long's original schedule. And, and I talked to her colleagues in London and looked at her. It was a, such a packed schedule. We managed to find just one short uh, two-hour uh, free space. And we managed to f this was the biggest room we were able to find at, at short notice. But I'm so delighted that you were able to, uh, to do this. Um, I think we should give her one last round of applause. <laughs>